moving, moving, though they're disapproving, keep them doggies moving, raw. Man, what is this, a Walmart commercial from 2002? <laughs> That's how you say that. I'm going to leave that. You're going to leave that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, this is how we're going to start this episode on the Boo 2 Boys. I'm the host, Cowboy Spencer, for one more week, and this is not a Walmart commercial from 2002. This is a episode of Rawhide, which was from 1962-ish in other years. But this episode that we're talking about this week was in 1962. As a matter of fact, just four months after the last episode aired on April 6th, 1962, season four, episode 26, Reunion. You may remember we talked a little bit about Grandma's Money last week. We're back for more. I've got the same wrestlers with me. Ben Lee, how are you doing? This is kind of a reunion of, of our its own. own. A reunion within a reunion. And you made a mistake. It's fine. It's not a big deal. Ramrod Van Lee. I don't remember you getting that promotion. Well, it happened since our last episode. Okay. It's been a well, while. Good, good job. It's been a week. Wrestler Brian Vaughn, how are your wrestling days going? Thing is, I also got a promotion. I was deputy. That's uh, right. I, I mentioned being deputized at the beginning of last so you're episode. Now. I am the sheriff. Turns out the sheriff has met an untimely end. He got shot. Mm hmm. By Bob Marley. Yeah, I did it. Oh, oh I, Bob Marley did it. <laughs> he didn't do it, is what I heard. Oh, Eric Clapton did it. No, he that did. actually sounds about right. Yeah, he's these pretty days, awful. I guess all days, I just didn't know about mm -hmm. how he was. You know what I just realized is that Bob Marley really does say he did shoot the sheriff. And not the deputy. Right. He didn't shoot them both. So I'm mistaken. My Bob Marley trivia has not come in handy for me there. <laughs> Indeed. Let's uh, not talk about reggae anymore. And we'll talk about raw. <laughs> we'll talk about ska instead. We're going to come back and do a little bit of a different look this episode. As I mentioned, no Clint Eastwood at all. We've got... A little look at Gil Favor, the actual trail boss for our Rawhide group, although he, too, is only in about half this episode. We've got some notable guest stars to go into. Largely a big one is that we actually got more Matthew Perry. He wasn't just in Friends. He's in this episode. 1960s television, Matthew Perry. Oh, what's that? It's time for another round of Perry or Scary. <laughs> Last time around, I gave you fellas... Trivia from Matthew Perry's recent autobiography. Can't believe this has come up again. Well, this time around on Perry or Scary, since we're talking about Matthew Perry, and it's probably the same one, I don't know yet. I haven't watched this episode. <laughs> uh, we comment on it live. That's what we do right, for our episodes. Right, exactly. It's like, a, it's like riff tracks in that way. Mm -hmm. I decided this time, though, I'd like to present trivia from Matthew Perry's IMDb page with some of my own horse shit mixed in. So it should be noted, some of the IMDb stuff might also not be true. I don't know. Anyone can put stuff on there. It's really gone downhill since they took the forums off <laughs> back in 2017. But a common complaint on this podcast. So you two will work together to decide if it's Perry, true, or scary, I made it up. We're going to see if we have the same chemistry that we have when we're out in the trail and we're leading the cattle around. Right, right, we do right. a really good job then. Well, Van, you need to display the same skills that made you ramrod. Correct. All right. First up, Matthew Perry is missing part of the middle finger on his right hand because of a door shutting accident in preschool. I think I would have noticed that. Agreed. So I think that's a scary. I'm good to go <laughs> with a scary. No, that's a Perry. That's so he true. Wears, he wears a, a prosthetic then? According to someone on IMDb, this is true. That's all I know about it. Let's go back and see if he's missing a chunk of his finger when he's hugging Monica in that episode. I mentioned during our Friends episodes that Matthew Perry dated Julia Roberts. Well, he also dated other 1990s icons. I bet he did. During his Friends run, including Marge Simpson, Dunkaroos, the Budweiser Frogs, and Denver Broncos quarterback John Elway. <laughs> Perry or scary? That's pretty Perry because I remember the headlines when he and Elway were uh, caught making out in the back of that restaurant. If only that were true news, I would. <laughs> I would. This would be a better and more interesting world. Obviously, that's a you scary. guys uh, sniffed me out there. All right, Matthew Perry was drafted by the Ottawa Loggers in the 1996 Roller Hockey International Draft. Was he Canadian? I don't think so. He's too mean. Yeah, and I don't see him as doing anything physical, even though he was in shape. I don't know that he's an athlete. Well, he's pretty fat in that one episode. Well, He's yeah. losing all that weight. Yeah, but yeah. Courtney Cox fixes that. <laughs> I think I'm going along with the same trail that you were on. Scary. Yeah. Okay. Let's mm. go scary. Too bad. It's Perry. This is a Canadian man born in Ottawa. 
Huh. So he, Matthew Perry is Canadian. Yeah. Okay. Meanest one there is. I was going to say, how did it happen? <laughs> okay, I mentioned all that dating, though, but he also dated Lauren Graham, Nev Campbell, and Lizzie Kaplan. Is that Perry or scary? That's disappointing. It but... is scary, <laughs> but is it Perry? I would. I believe it. I believe it as well. Mm-hmm. Let's go Perry. I'll go Perry. That is true. <laughs> and gross. I like your disappointed reaction there on I that. I really like Nev Campbell, so you Lizzie she Kaplan. Could, you thought she did Yeah, better. I do too. All these people. Well, I saw her escape that <laughs> cook who made soup with fear. I didn't think that... <laughs> She was running to Matthew yeah. Perry. It was kind of like Phoebe's reaction in that episode where she finds out that he's with Monica and she says like, oh, she could do better. Exactly. All of these women could and probably later did do better. Okay. On set for a guest starring role, Perry impressed the cast of Caroline in the City with an array of close-up magic tricks. Is that Perry or scary? I think he mentioned him being on Caroline in the City, but I but might But I be would mention that too. Yes. Would. What's your gut? No. I don't feel like that happened. (laughs) Okay, I'll stick with that. Good gut, because I made that up. If it involves Caroline in the City, I probably falsified it. I get that a lot. That's a good gut you got there. Hey, Spencer, your gut will be accurate. (laughs) (laughs) Two more for you guys. This man, Matthew Perry, went to high school with Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Mm, I you don't now think know Trudeau. he is Canadian. Right, but you might have been setting us up for that. Like, now that we've yeah. established that lore about Matthew Perry, that he's from <laughs> Canada, we can tie him in with the, the most famous person in Canada, which is Justin Trudeau. Now, I do know Justin Trudeau looks a lot better than Matthew Perry, so I'm inclined to say he's younger, so I don't know if I buy it from Yeah, that but Matthew Perry did a lot of drugs, so maybe yeah, but he that's aged the other himself thing. up. Hmm. I would believe it, but I do think it is possible that Brian is leading us astray. What was your instinct? No? On this one, I don't I don't think I had a clear gut okay. on this one. Oh, so let's go. Let me. You do it. True. Justin Trudeau, Matthew Perry. We got good guts. Should have known because the name is Trudeau. <laughs> <laughs> We've got one more Perry or Scary before we get back to the reunion, a, an episode of Rawhide with zero grandma in it. Zero reggae either. <laughs> Perry does not see eye to eye with his general father about the treatment of the Pawnee. <laughs> is that Perry or Scary? Well... It's oh, technically Perry. I was going to say, it's not not true. Yeah, okay. I tricked you a little. It is a different Matthew Perry. <laughs> Did you guys realize this? I lied. I didn't no. know the whole time. It took to my third or but fourth But that's actually viewing. the Matthew Perry that's in this Rawhide episode, not the guy that was in Friends 50 years later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's a scary. Is That's a saying. scary. You yeah. guys did okay. You're not going to win the grand prize, which was which is Wizards in a Box or whatever that game was from <laughs> Wizards in a Maze, maybe uh, Wizards Maze, something like that yeah. from Legends of the Hidden Temple. That's but, in my closet over there. But we'll see. Good job. Not as good as the last Perry or Scary round, but maybe the next time that Matthew Perry gets brought up on the show, somehow I, I you imagine guys will ace it. That it will happen. Perry or Scary coming back. That was. <laughs> That was unexpected. I should have known. <laughs> I was hoping that the punishment for losing would be now you have to take a phone call from Matt Perry. And <laughs> talk to him. That, that's awful. Sorry, Matt Perry. If you're listening. About whatever topic he wants. <laughs> Canada, obviously. <Drugs>. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you co-opted the episode for a moment, I'm going to do the same. Fine. At the end of our second episodes, because we do these in twos, we always reveal the next show. And the host who is doing that show does so, except we do Hot Potato. But you get the idea. I have decided I'm going to do a little contest for fans out there. I'm going to sprinkle in inside jokes or jokes that will point towards what my show will be that we're covering the next couple of weeks, which I'll reveal at the end of this episode. So just keep in mind, they will be obscurely placed throughout. And I hope to do a good job, you know, getting all these in there. But let's face it, I'm no Superman. So we're doing Scrubs next. I was talking about uh, anyway, Reunion so Rawhide. It was really bad first hint if that's what it ends up being. Brian I have just, like a Brian dozen just hits. got it right away. Okay, fine. It would have really been appropriate, though. It would have been just perfect if you were the one covering Friends and you're like, you know, speaking of Matthew Perry, mm. I'm going to do a show with Matthew Perry if that had been your hint. We had the order in the wrong way. We should have <laughs> done Friends yet. But it's not going to be Friends, is it? I already did Friends. Are you doing Aftermash? Correct. <laughs> I actually thought you were going to flip the script completely and just be like, before we do this, here's what I'm doing next time. I was like, okay, that's fine. We can do that up top. I'm going to steal your thunder right up top. Oh, you mentioned this is a contest. If someone gets it right, yeah, what, what do they, they win? The call from Matthew Perry. <laughs> oh, cool. Like but they can talk about whatever they want to talk about, not Matthew Perry. And he Perry. has to listen. Yeah. Is he okay with that? No. No. <laughs> no, he's very upset, but I had some dirt on him and we're that good to go. can't be hard. Got to be a lot of dirt out there. It's on about Matthew drugs. Perry. I need to get hold of Lauren Graham and ask her how good of a listener Matthew Perry is. <laughs> I thought you were going to say lover. How good of a lover Matthew Perry is. <laughs> I know the answer to that. Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so Reunion, Rawhide, Season 4, Episode 26. This one is War Looms as an army general's son, which is Matthew Perry, <laughs> seeks peace. And the son of a Pawnee chief raids settlers. The drivers are helped by Pete Nolan, who is scouting for the army. And as we talked about in the last episode, this is a return for Pete Nolan, who has scouted for... The Mets. <laughs> <laughs> who has scouted for Gil previously, but then left to work for the army as their scout. He comes back here, does some scouting work for them again, and then he's gone at the end of the episode once again. So we get a few different people this time. I'm going to start with the guest stars. Walter Pigeon with a D. Walter Pidgeon. a bird, guys. (laughs) Street Hawk. Holy shit. Walter Pigeon. Spoiler, but this is not the final bird name of this episode (laughs) at all. I wrote these down, and even I don't know what that reference is, but Walter Pigeon is Augustus Perry, who is Lieutenant Matthew Perry's evil, evil general father. (laughs) And then we have Anthony Caruso. Let's go ahead and talk about this right now. Anthony Caruso was an Italian-American who played gangsters usually in most films. He had character roles in mafia movies, gangster movies. He played Greyhawk in this movie. Another the bird. Native American. Yes. But yes, another bird. None of the American Indian roles ever went to that at this time. Certainly like, at this time, They didn't do yeah. that. No, that, no. That just didn't happen. They do a thing with a different actor who you may or may not bring up who plays his son, Greyhawk's son, who is Puerto Rican. So they're like, I don't know, Puerto Rican, Italian, they look like yep. that'll do. And that, all you have to do is give them the, the American Indian hair, I guess mm-hmm. is what they think, and a hatchet or something. And it's like, yeah, that's that's clearly American Indian. It's so Indian. wild that due to racism, essentially, like casting directors were committed to making their movies worse and less <laughs> true looking. Yeah. Just bizarre. And, and still are to some extent. Yeah, they're just now getting to that. <laughs> That's Eugene Iglesias, who is Wild Horse, the son of Greyhawk, who's gone rogue and started raiding villages out of desperation. There's also Daryl Hickman, who plays Matthew Perry, and Judson Pratt, who plays Sergeant Morgan, the guy who tries to translate in this episode for Augustus. He is Augustus's right-hand man, the only man who can kind of tell it like it is to Augustus. Going forward, I'm either going to refer to you as General Perry, or I guess we can call him... The general, the like, general, like the car yeah. insurance. Yeah, that, it'll be it'll be that going forward. I'm not going to keep describe to the general to save some time. <laughs> I'm not going to keep going with Augustus. The, at this the point car forward. insurance general looks a lot more fun than, than <laughs> Augustus general does. But he is oftentimes kind of being like, I, now what he said is, I hate you and I want everyone to die. But what he means is. We're going to do everything we can to figure out that solution there. Morgan is nothing more than the stepdad who the adult kids come to visit, and he's trying to play the intermediary between the actual parent and the kids, right? He's newer to the family. He doesn't know the kid intimately like the parent, but he wants them to get along because he he loves Augustus so much. He's just a melty-faced gloop of a man. Morgan? Yeah, he looks like what everybody looked like in the 1960s who was in film. Like just an older, broad, rectangle-faced white guy who wears his cap askew and is like, ah, I'm sloppy and everyone loves me. Well, the thing is, by the time you're 35 or so, the hard-living lifestyle at that time made your body begin to ferment or <laughs> something. Yeah. So, like, I bet you Morgan's, like, 38. (laughs) He's got to be at least, like, around 50. I would would think. 27. (laughs) He is not as old as he looks. I I would agree 100% on that. Let's just get right in to whatever this episode's called. I didn't put it on here. Uh, Grandma's money. (laughs) Let's go back and do... (laughs) Let's get right into reunion. We open with the trail crew positively dying of thirst. They're very, very thirsty for this water that is... Not anywhere, and they're out in the wilderness, and no one knows where any water is. I mean, you could really use a good scout like Pete Nolan at this time, but <laughs> he's not around. He's in the army. So there's no water around, and the canteens are running low, and there's a brief conversation between Gil, who is the lead, again, in this episode, the trail boss. He's telling his man, you need to go easy on that canteen. And the guy's like, dude, I have been nursing this canteen for a long time. How long do you expect me to do this? And Gil gives in and says, fine, you can fill it up a little bit, but we got to be careful here. In the middle of this little back and forth about dying of thirst, we get another member of the crew comes up and says, guys, Mushy's found something. This is- <laughs> Which I would be like, I don't need to see a dead bird. <laughs> <laughs> this is huge. We've got to get there right away. So everyone runs over. Mushy is standing at attention in front of a flag 
and does not look away from the flag the whole scene. Well, this whole time they're like, you're not going to believe what you see. This is going to blow your mind. And then the first thing I see as it's a mushy. viewer is Mushy saluting a flag, unflinching, not saying anything, not smiling. I don't know who any of these characters are. Nope. And so I thought this was the thing that they came to see was a man saluting a flag I think and the, not moving. The Texas flag, I think, yeah. also. Really weird. I'm still not 100% not confused about this scene. I agree. That's why my notes had to be pretty vague here because even having done my best to actually learn who Gil's crew is, I don't really know what's going on here. Mushy remains a mystery. Sure. <laughs> and they're all about to die of thirst, though, and this is a big breakthrough. We see... A trail of rocks on the ground in the shape of an arrow, kind of like the Blair Witch Project a little bit, and it's pointing them towards something. I have to assume at this point that Blair Witch was busy making her <laughs> way east to Massachusetts to scare those teens. Mm -hmm. Took her like 130 years to get there. <laughs> she might have still been alive uh, right now, not like a weird spectral witch. These rocks, guys, they point towards something that's really important for the trailblazing crew right now, which is... Can I say what it is? Yeah. Hole. Yeah. <laughs> It's a water hole. It's not a Baywatch hole, though. It's no. not that big. Is that guy's name John Hole from the last one? Yeah, It's it not is. John Hole like Otis Ames. It's an actual <laughs> genuine certified water hole. Unlike John Hole, you can drink out of this thing. <laughs> and keep in mind that Wishbone or whoever it was was telling uh, Gil that you're not going to fucking believe it's what water. you're about to see. It's a hole in the ground. This is going to be shit. one of those things where your head spins around in a circle <laughs> and then up into a steam top because... You're first going to see a man saluting a flag, right? <laughs> well, Fucking she... weird. <laughs> then you're going to see a line of rocks with an arrow pointing. Blair Witch. Blair Witch. Then you get hole. <laughs> what does all of it mean? I don't know. Just drink the water. I would think that if I drank water after witnessing those circumstances, more poisoning, just like <laughs> grandma. You've never had water this good. Do you guys remember what it tastes like when they start Sweet sucking on it? Sweet as Texas dirt or yes, something. Yeah. Sweet as Texas Eat? Sugar. Sugar. We just text the sugar. You know what's wild? I did not put that in my notes and still, for some reason, remembered that. That's how it rides good. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out this is actually a gift from Pete, who left He every... dug that hole. He, he did all this <laughs> himself. He set up the rocks. I guess he planted the flag. He, I'm <laughs> That's got to be difficult. That's a heavy this. flag. Pete's really good at scouting. Already, we get a sense that Pete is a bit of a Ben Zobrist. You can, <laughs> you can put Pete in any role and he'll do what's right, whether that's take the walk, Slap a line drive the other way, or ball on the inner half, you might pull that thing over the fence. Or dig a hole. I really hope, and in my head, this, this is real, that when you guys are doing the Nasty Cast, there's been some people that came over to Boop Boop Boys with it. Sure. In my heart, I like to believe that those people are still here for all these baseball references we make in the middle oh, of yeah. this. Oh, yeah. And I guarantee there actually are oh, several Oh, yeah, of them. for sure. So they're going to love, love that Ben guys. Zobris line. If any baseball fans are listening to this episode and want to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. <laughs> we'll get a Ben Zobris tattoo. I've already done that. It's too late. <laughs> or a hole tattoo. Yeah, sure. Just tattoo of a hole. Which is weird. I've already got several real holes. <laughs> so do you guys. I usually use them. You have to. We'll die. <laughs> So Pete's left a little goodie bag for him. He's got, he's got a little <laughs> note, kisses and eagle's claw, <laughs> you know, just normal stuff. And this is, he lets him know this is the only water hole for miles. I always thought watering hole was kind of like a- Where you go to bathe? Uh, like, no, just like, oh, you gotta go to the watering hole to get fill your canteen. Okay, so it's a lake or whatever. I didn't know it no, was a, a hole full of water. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't leave much to the imagination. <laughs> this is actually pretty useful to kind of figure out how incredibly desolate this all was too. Like they would, it literally was the only way they could stay alive for any other water hole. There was nothing else nearby. Do you get a sense of how desperate they are that this little hole of water that we're making fun of, like, well, we get to stay alive. We get to yeah. live. It's Life a big changing. deal. It really establishes that when we see Pete Nolan later, we know he is the, he's a big deal. Unerring sense of good in the episode. By the way, the eagle's claw that was in the little goodie bag was from Greyhawk, and he gave that to Pete as a token of good luck, to something about speeding him on his journey or something. And Pete thinks that this crew could stand to have that for themselves. This is such clear exposition, and I don't even mind it. It makes sense where Pete's like, I got this on the trail from Greyhawk, a character who needs to be brought up in this first scene, but we don't really know how. So I'll just say like, hey, he gave this to me for good luck. I'm passing that luck on to you. I felt like it was a strangely natural way to name drop a character. Juxtapose this with the street hawk thing <laughs> where they're like, oh, let's talk about this woman forever and then zoom into a picture of her. <laughs> well, compare it to 
the next couple of scenes, which I've referred to as exposition conversations. Oh, yes. Yeah. That involve Pete Nolan, who's in almost right. all this of them. Right, this is downright elegant yeah, compared this to is that. Great. While the episode is trying to get its legs here, these several scenes, I had to rewatch them over mm-hmm. and over and over again to figure out what is going on here. And what I also did. I weirdly think this is a strength of the show in that they do not hold your hand in terms of the plotting. They're just like, we're doing what we're doing, you figure it out. And that's great because too many shows now, the complaint is that they hold your hand too much. That was a big thing with The Witcher show that they might even be canceling. People are mad because executives came out and said, well, the show's bad because we dumb it down for everybody in the audience. It's like, well, don't do that. Right. And maybe people will come and you can make a good thing. I think I've mentioned this maybe even on the podcast before, but I read something from like an interview with some TV writers who mentioned that a lot of executives on TV shows will pretty much demand if you're writing for like an NCIS style show, you need to curb the twist. Like we want to make sure that your median person's going to get the twist and think they're smart halfway through or whatever. Like it is a strategy, but I think Now, with so many shows available, more and more people are saying, well, that's not really enough. I'm going to need a show that actually makes me feel full. (laughs) There are a lot of shows that all just kind of blend together in a big mush because they all did that. And Mm -hmm. there's so many of them like that. And you'll hear people complain now, like, why are the writers striking? Their writing ain't even good. And it's because they're being hamstrung by executives who now run everything in the world. And creativity is stifled just to make the biggest dollar. And so, of course, the writers are going to struggle with that. You should be grateful that the shows are at least competent because the writers are working around these shitty executives. So, anyway, right? Just like always, the best TV now is as good as it ever is at that time. Mm -hmm. And the writing on those shows, fantastic. But it's not coincidental, I think, that those shows tend to be on networks like HBO that allow more creative control. They let creative people do it. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that will even continue. With their merger. Yeah. Who knows? Well, it's going to be reality TV now. It's about this time when watching the episode that- Oh yeah, we're talking about Rawhide. (laughs) Rawhide reunion. I looked up their IMDb to see something, and I noticed that there's a character in this episode named Narbo. What? And that's it, just Narbo. I did not put him in the cast on purpose. So you knew Narbo was there. I don't know who he is, but yeah, yeah, I I saw his name. For all we know, Narbo's in all over. these several parts he's in these, and I just didn't notice. It was General Narbo. If (laughs) Narbo's anything like his name sounds, I feel like that is a redundancy with mushy. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, he's certainly a doofus, right? Oh, it has to be. Yeah, these people who I just say, one of Gil's men, I am sure one of those guys is Narbo. You know what? Mushy's a total Horus. He really is. Okay, I can get behind that. By the way, I think Narbo was played by Zach Braff. (laughs) I guess Scrubs earlier, but now I'm not sure. Yeah, now he's kind (laughs) of, I'm not sure. He's really got me thrown. Garden State. (laughs) The show. (laughs) (laughs) I'd watch it. So next we meet Pete, this great scout who we've only heard about so far. We get to see him in person as he speaks to Greyhawk, the Pawnee Chief, about General Augustus Perry. (laughs) Old Iron Pants himself and his sinister reputation. The chief worries that violence is brewing and something bad is going to happen because his son, Wild Horse, he has gone on his own mission here. He's kind of tired. He's rogue. Uh, He's out there in the wild doing his own agenda, which does not line up with the peace agreement that Greyhawk has negotiated with the army. And Pete's grizzled, thick, rectangular face with bushy eyebrows. We see it here. And it doesn't gel or match his like frilly cool jacket. It yeah, just kind of he's contrasts. got a cool outfit. Like he looks like he's a man of the outdoors. I don't know something about looking at him. I thought this man is in westerns. He yeah, needs to be in westerns. He's a western solid, good old meat and potato man. Mm-hmm. The problem is twofold. It's not just wild horse here. It's also that he doesn't like General Perry and. His past experience with him leads him to believe that he can't be trusted and he's going to do something bad. So. Greyhawk is pretty sure something shitty is going down. And Pete's like, ah, I think it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. And Greyhawk reveals that he has, of course, fought against the general in the past. Called him Timberwolf. Introducing a third name for this character. Augustus Perry, Mm -hmm. Timberwolf, and, of course, Old Iron Pants. And let's just get this out there. That is a good nickname. Iron Pants is good. It's exactly what they called Margaret Thatcher. (laughs) (laughs) For what it's worth on that note, Pete does say, hey, you know, that was a different time for General Perry when he was a captain. He was a he was a That's mean the guy rank. then. Wait till you meet him now. He's real nice. He's gotten cool. He's gotten so <laughs> yeah, cool since really then. laid back, sensitive modern attitudes. 
We have another round of people to meet to be introduced to here in this episode, which is Lieutenant Matthew Perry and his small group of soldiers. They are en route to General Perry, where father and son will be reunited at last. It's not clear exactly how long it's been, but they haven't seen each other for a long time. At least five years, because he talked about being in West Point for four and he hadn't seen him since then, at least. Right. General Perry could not, of course, be bothered to attend the graduation, so he didn't. He hasn't been a part of his son's life for a long time, and Matt here has a lot of doubt that he can ever live up to his father's big name. Right now, there's like some hero worship for his dad. Which makes sense. I think he would definitely feel the weight of that being that he's rising in the army himself, and he's like, shit, I'm never going to be as good as my dad was at being in the army. Following the same career path. It's like you're Jacob Dylan, right? And you're like, <laughs> well, I'm in the wallflowers, but I'm not my fucking dad, am I? <laughs> he's thinking, uh, maybe, if I'm lucky, I'll be old bronze pants. <laughs> <laughs> this is another scene where Pete is there, so I don't know how. He was with Greyhawk, <laughs> and he's also with Lieutenant Perry, and he's like, same thing. Ah, oh, it'll be fine. I think General Perry's going to love you. And, you know, you're pretty cool and you're a good soldier, so don't worry about it. I know I know, it didn't seem like it'll be fine. We got like 42 minutes left. <laughs> like, probably there would be more incident. This whole episode is just people going from place to place and it's always fine. <laughs> Everything's good there. And yet it isn't, is it? Now it's time to meet General Perry himself. So no, it is not <laughs> fine. He is stationed in a tent, which is kind of cool. I'd like my base of operations to be run out of a tent someday. I, you know, this is a Game of Thrones thing, too. Like, <laughs> oh, the leader has his own it tent. It really does directly connect to, like, medieval it warfare. Does. It's yeah, people so have weird. just always done it, and I really enjoy watching this sort of thing. Like, oh, he's got his map he's looking at. What is he even doing? He's just sitting at a table in a tent with, like, a... I don't know, some kind of book open? I think he's being mad. He's looking at the Charting picture of his course. dead wife, and that's it. <laughs> Well, he's doing Why that. is he carrying that with him at all times? But it's not like a little picture. Yeah, it's right. a fold-out, like, book-sized You know what picture. it's for. What do you think he's doing? He's It's it's lonesome. <laughs> it's going to be real iron hard, am I right? <laughs> well, though, Morgan's there. Uh, well, Morgan is a really good right-hand man, and he enters. He needs his left, too. Beaming. <laughs> beaming due to the impending arrival of Matt. Well, so here's the thing. Sergeant Morgan is very excited about seeing Matthew Perry, Lieutenant Matthew Perry, but General Iron Pants <laughs> does not have that same high regard for his son. I wonder how he turned out. Like all the rest of them, no doubt, from West Point. Book learning, polished boots, shiny fingernails. Not the shiny fingernails. <laughs> People who read are worthless and dumb. I don't get why he's so disgusted about the West Point thing. I think it's Sorry. just one of those things where it's like, you know, if you're not fighting men in the war, you ain't. You got to farm all day and work hard. None of that book learning good no, for you. I, mm, I hate that. I think, you know, probably our generation is familiar with the divide of maybe older members of the family not understanding the sorts of careers younger people get into now. Like, which doesn't really apply to any of us, but like, say you're a coder or something. I, I don't think an older generation would see that as work. They'd be like, you're just sitting there. You're just doing on a computer. What? Right. Mm -hmm. You're not working with your hands. You're not getting dirty. You're not working at the toilet factory. You're not doing mud baths with Grandma and Ames. You're not a really sassy janitor who's mean to everyone who comes into the hospital. <laughs> I can't help but enjoy, too, that he's just, oh, the sh his shiny fingernails. I can't stand <laughs> a man with shiny fingernails. I like how he's also preemptively hating his son. Yeah. Like, his son's not even there. He's like, I bet my son's a real prissy bitch, <laughs> isn't he, Morgan? There's no way he's nearly as strong as me. He definitely hones in on that he thinks he's a soft, kind of weak little runt. Because he mentions he takes after his mom. He's not really like me. And he's educated in a cushy college. And I just don't think I'm going to like him or have anything in common with him. I knew something went wrong with my son the second he was smart. <laughs> And West Point, that's such a cushy job to have when you're Who in college. Who of any importance has ever gone to West Point? And Sergeant Morgan, being that he actually does like Lieutenant Perry, says, well, I think he's probably going to be pretty cool, and I think he's going to be a good soldier, and you're going to be proud of him. I'll be his dad if you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, it's time for this big father and son moment to happen at last. Lieutenant Perry rides up. He's greeted warmly by Sergeant Morgan. It's going great. It's going to keep going great. Yeah, actually a little too warmly because Sergeant Morgan doesn't do the the formal army greeting thing. He just kind of is like, Matt, how the fuck are you? And then they realize, oh, shit, Lieutenant Morgan, sir. And I wish they would have done a complicated handshake. <laughs> 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 they share this very informal greeting before stopping themselves for the proper salutes. And then the young Perry enters the elder Perry's tent. 
Matt is happy to see his father, and he tries to greet him accordingly, but General is not having any of that, and I like their interaction so much, we're going to do another clip right away here. Mr. Perry, you're out of uniform. Didn't they teach you at West Point how to dress properly? Well, yes, sir. It's, it's just that out here in the West, it's not so strict. There's only one acceptable reply to my statement, Mr. Perry. That reply is, no excuse, sir. And your fingernails are too shiny. No excuse, sir. Uh, Matthew Perry, the young one, sounds like he went to like the OP school of acting. He's like, oh, yeah. gee whiz, shucks, fella. It's Which, just that kind of Are you actor. talking shit about Daryl Hickman? <laughs> I, don't, I don't even think this is intentional, but that works to the show's advantage later when Matt starts standing up for himself. I didn't think he would be to the extent it's that true. it is. Yeah, it's actually pretty effective. And the weird thing about this guy, about Daryl Hickman, is... He flubs probably four or five Constantly. lines and Love is it. not a bad actor. No, it yeah. actually works to a degree. Because he's supposed to be nervous and unsure yeah. a lot of the time. Especially in this half of the episode. But I don't think he did it on purpose. I don't either. I think no. he just missed lines. I think it's they do 30 episodes a season. They have the film. They're like, it's good enough. They probably, but it worked. I bet they were like a meat grinder with these episodes. Mm-hmm. They were just churning and that shit out. some shows could use a little more we leave natural flubs in. Mm-hmm. I Humanity. Think. Yeah, to a degree. I mean, you don't want anything that just clearly sounds like someone reading a line wrong. But someone casually misspeaking like a person would, I think would it should happen more. I wanted to comment on how the general is like, Matt, you piece of shit. Look, you slob. You're dressed up in a uniform just as ornate and complicated as mine. <laughs> I, I don't see how that's dressing down. He had to Matt's button wearing. like one button, which wasn't really show. It was bizarre. He was yeah, fine. I just don't get it. You're showing your gams, son. <laughs> and doesn't that seem like a weird thing for an old school guy to care about? Like the uniform? Well, actually, no, it doesn't. As a general, though, you have to kiss ass and be by the book. You're right. I forget that sometimes they're little fashion, that that those types are real fashionistas if there's rules involved. It doesn't line up with this whole, like, oh, he's a pretty boy with shiny nails and nice boots. It doesn't, it doesn't mix there. So, yeah, you know, Augustus Perry here is a, is a jackass. (laughs) I don't like him much. What do you guys think so Uh, far? I hate him and I... Not going to be liking him anymore. <laughs> By the end, it's kind of like, okay, we get it. He's a bad guy. Stop <laughs> having him do the worst thing a person would do every single scene. My problem is that the nickname Iron Pants is awesome. <laughs> I don't think he should get to have an awesome nickname. He's that bad. Is it supposed to be a compliment to him? I, I don't know how I that suppose. is. I don't know. Got hard pants. I bet that had a connotation we don't understand any longer. Yeah, yeah. I think you're probably right. Well, because if you Google old Iron Pants, there are like a dozen cowboy shows that use that nickname. I got a lot of weird links from Googling. <laughs> you guys both Googled? No, I, I made that okay. up. Okay, <laughs> I was going to be... He's talking about peepees. <laughs> old Iron Pants. <laughs> so it's at this point after being dressed down that Matt introduces famed scout Pete Nolan to Augustus, and General Perry says, you're the one who made that unauthorized piece with that... Fucker, Pawnee, oh, I hate Hawk. peace. Matt attempts to barrel right through that awkwardness by stating, well, you know, we're, we can go see Greyhawk right now and kind of put the final touch to that peace arrangement that we've got settled. And General Perry says, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to meet Greyhawk. And I have even sent that cattle back, the 500 grade A head of cattle, the best cattle there is in the world. I sent it back where it came from. He's not getting that. Obviously, everyone else in the room is freaked out by this. They're like, all stunned. What do you mean? We could fix this right now and just have peace. Uh, there will be no peace with Greyhawk. Only a firing squad or jail, says General Perry. Perry has recent reports that change everything in his mind, which is multiple Pawnee raids in the area, and wonders just why they're making peace given these developments. And what he does is he holds open his report. That he wrote paper himself. that he wrote or whatever. He shows it to Pete Nolan, and you have to say his full name every fucking time. Pete Nolan shows Scout up on screen. Pete Nolan. And anyway, the general takes his finger and reads with his finger like all important military men do. They can't well, read unless they point at Well, he didn't go to West Point like his stupid, fancy, <laughs> smart, shiny-fingered son. Matt points out these are recent raids carried out by Wild Horse, Greyhawk's son, and that's not indicative of how the Pawnees are wanting to handle things in general. That's just kind of a rogue unit, so to speak. They aren't representative of the Pawnees as a whole. And Pete points out, it's been eight months since they brokered the peace and nothing has come of it. The Pawnee are still waiting on the army to make good of their side. They're supposed to have taken care of them and given them the cattle. Because they haven't in those eight months, the Pawnee are starving. They Understandably, they're mad. They didn't do any hunting because they thought they were provided for. Greyhawk assured his men that they would not have to hunt. So at this point, they're desperate. They're starving and desperate. Wild Horse has taken it upon himself to find a solution. 
it's not one that Greyhawk agrees with, but it's it's still he had his reasons, and it's again outside of what Greyhawk was even giving permission for. This is an argument that General Perry is in the wrong here right from the very beginning. However, that doesn't matter because it never does. He <laughs> sends them away, and even Sergeant Morgan is horrified at what's happening here. And that's like his best bud. And Matt does not mince words. Right away, he's like, I don't hate the Native people like you do, Dad. When he's defending the Native Americans, he says, we drove them off their land, killed their buffalo, giving all the reasons why they would hate them. And I wanted to touch on this, and this is a real thing. A lot of people don't seem to understand what the European settlers did to buffalo and the Native Americans. They slaughtered them. And I don't mean they saw a couple and killed them. They almost eradicated the entire species because to the Native American populations, those were cows. Cows are not right. native to the U.S. Cows were European. So buffalo were the meat source. And so basically, they essentially wiped that out. And it wasn't for the settlers just to get meat or hide or whatever. It was strictly to wipe out the Native yeah, it was Americans. It part of the right? whole genocide. It was horrendous. And there are photos out there. I ask people to Google this. You can see piles of buffalo skulls that all these pioneer people just murdered to stop the Native Americans from being able to just live in the country. Yeah, like a spiteful slaughter sort of thing. Yeah, it's like disgusting. So go check it out. It is not just a little bit. It, it's gross. And it was a lot of buffalo. And it's amazing we still have some. Now, Ted Turner has the largest buffalo herd of anyone in the world. He's a big buffalo man. I sure do love them buffaloes. They're so pretty and fuzzy. Well, you can see them on TBS if you're lucky. But they have a good life there with Ted Turner. Sure. He probably hangs out with them. Rawhide, for its part, I was kind of surprised, does not try to really shake hands with both sides here either. They know General Perry is evil. They are aware of the crimes perpetrated against Native Americans. Well, and I guess I wasn't aware that we already knew that at this time in American history. So I was surprised that the show was able to take such a correct stance on it. I would have thought that they were a little bit more behind the times at that point. So it is it interesting. Good news. And I think after thinking about this, because we have another somewhat progressive scene that we'll talk about later, but I kind of believe that this was filmed in 62 or whatever. We're in the 60s. We're in the free love era. And I think it's people kind of getting into that uh, mm -hmm. political proclivity, if I, you will. I was thinking about it too. And then I, and I realized, oh, John F. Kennedy's already been elected. Yeah. So it does make sense. But it, I think being in black and white also. Yeah, throws it off. Really. Uh -huh. colors my perspective. <laughs> That's a good point. You don't associate like a, a black and white Western to take a sympathetic view to the American right. Indians. It's typically they're the, the bad guys. When I think black and white Western, I think John Wayne, who was a Nazi. <laughs> Later, as they're setting up camp, Matt and Pete are talking about all this. What, what an asshole the general is. And Matt does I wanted to join in <laughs> a little bit here. He, he basically, he acknowledges, yeah, he, that's terrible that he's ruining this peace opportunity. But, you know, he hasn't always been like this. My dad was a good guy once and happy, and he used to laugh around the house. And... One time he laughed at one of Mother's <laughs> jokes. And then Mother died, and he's been a real bitch ever since then, essentially. is the He was never different after that. I never saw him laugh again. Not even at the hilarious comedy stylings <laughs> of Red Skelton. <laughs> <laughs> wow. In fact, Matt said when he was growing up, his dad was so fun, he didn't even understand how he could have been called Old Iron Pants. He was like, I don't get it. This guy's great. Me, again, it sounds like a fun name. That's a fun person. A Pete responds to this in silence and takes off his pants, and the, and the scene ends. <laughs> That's uh, Scout Pete Did you Nolan. guys notice that? Yes. Yeah. He, he just nods at him, doesn't say anything, and starts unbuckling his <laughs> All right, we best get to it. <laughs> <laughs> I loved that. That was just a strange, and the, it's almost like it wasn't scripted, and they're like, well, like, we're just going to have to cut the scene here and, and leave it at that. <laughs> I don't know why the fuck you started doing that. <laughs> Pete Scout's better with no pants. <laughs> Right after Pete takes his pants off, we go to the general, and this is a very small hint of possibly wanting to plant seeds in your head that General Oliver, which is what I want to call him, <laughs> General Perry is not all bad because he's still thinking about his son all this time later. And he tells Sergeant Morgan, you know, that's a fine looking boy, don't you think? And Morgan says, he's a fine looking man. You just ain't got the eyes to see it yet. He's all man. Burned. I know this is not a redeemable character, but that was a, it reminded me a little bit of the grandma when you get their first sense of maybe she's starting to get close to Rowdy in her head, even though she's trying to con him. I thought they were hinting there might be redemption for this horrible guy sometime later in the episode because he's, he's still thinking about his son all those hours And later. there's some degree at this point to me where 
wow, he lets Morgan say this stuff. He can't be so totalitarian. Right. There's a softer side to General Perry. And it's not in the pants. <laughs> no, those <laughs> are iron. iron. <laughs> we'll get to that. The iron in his pants and maybe what happens with Pete not wearing pants after the break. The next morning, the sleeping army is awakened by something we don't see, but that apparently is a really big deal. And the music here, I made note of it. I love it. The score here is super creepy. And everyone has risen from their sleep or from their less alert state and is on high alert now. We just, we don't know why. Everyone's scrambling around. Matt and Pete race to the general's tent where he's doing some early morning calisthenics. He's uh, touching his toes, and I think this is as strenuous an exercise <laughs> as you could do then. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why he's old iron pants. He's not very flexible. Can't bend at the knee. After he was done, he had a real self-satisfied mm -hmm. look like, wow, I'd like to see you try that, son. So the general is real pleased with his morning workout. He leaves the tent, takes in the morning air, and says, ah, oh, we don't have air like that back east. Pete points out to the horizon, which is what everyone's all worked up about, and says, you don't have this out east either, General. Pawnee smoke signals. Which pretty good burn there, too. You know how to read those still? I'm guessing, by the way, General Perry doesn't answer. I'm guessing no. He does <laughs> not know how he to does. read those. He actually he says he? something like, of course, and then he's, he's diligently watching it. He, I think he could he be. May, I think he did and just doesn't think it's important enough now. to. Okay. I, I feel like he would not keep up with that. He'd I think like, if he could read them, he'd be following along the smoke signals in the sky with his with finger. <laughs> I think he reads all smoke signals as war. Well, here's the thing. For those who haven't listened to previous episodes or don't know me, Van Lee, I have a lot of Native American blood. Therefore... In him. It's not like a thing where he keeps I keep a jar. It well, next to me. That in addition. <laughs> but I can read smoke signals. I don't know what? if you guys even knew this. So I, no. I And it's, this is like a fun behind the scenes fact because the smoke signals they were doing were real. It's like an Easter egg, you know, when you watch a Shyamalan movie and there's something in the background or whatever. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's what this is. So I translated them for you. Oh, good. I bet okay. these are real. Okay, let's <laughs> see what they are. What they say, the Native Americans there, is they say, European women are so fat that when they go camping, the bears hide their food. Oh, shit. Is this wild horse doing this? That's what it says. <laughs> and in fact, later on in the episode, there's another one. I'll just go ahead and read that now. You, if you guys want to hear it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, European women are so dumb. It takes them two hours to watch 60 Minutes with Mike Wallace. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Those are good burns. <laughs> I have more respect for the Pawnee than I already did now. European women are so ugly, even Ripley doesn't believe it. Oh. You know, it makes sense. I forgot Wild Horse was on the dais for the roast of Bob Saget that one year. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, there's one last one. You guys want to hear that, too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. European women are so classless, they're practically a Marxist utopia. Oh, those Pawnee are savage guys. Yeah, and that makes you think a little, too, about forms of government, which Certainly. most, like, yo mama type jokes don't do. <laughs> so, well, I wouldn't go most. <laughs> now that reframes what General Perry's thinking when he's reading that. Let's assume, let's give him the benefit of the doubt, that he can read these, and he's looking at these smoke signals, and he's reading that in his head like, right. yo mama is so fat. I think <laughs> yeah, now we're going to kill Greyhawk. I think now it makes all his actions justifiable. <laughs> we get it, yeah. He burned him too good not to fight back. Pete once again entreats the general, will you at least meet with Greyhawk for God's sake? And Matt pipes in and says, he really wants peace. Let him show it to you in person. General says, look, I can read smoke signals really well. And I don't think that he is going to surrender. I don't think there's any way that he can demonstrate his desire for peace unless he does. It turns out you don't have to be in the fire to get a sick burn. <laughs> Because of the smoke, you can see it from a right, distance. Right, right. Come on, that was clever. No, was I great. liked it. I liked it. <laughs> it's kind of a three-part joke in a way with the, <laughs> the subtext that these were razes being mm -hmm. sent from Wild Horse's camp. So This is where Pete tells General Perry about how the raids that are being carried out have nothing to do with Greyhawk and that he can be trusted. General Perry's unsurprisingly not moved. Pete says, fine, can I at least guide the nearby cattle drivers through this territory? since you're doing everything in your power to make them hostile. The general says, you know what, Pete? They know the risks of this job. And quite frankly, your duty is to the army now. So no, you can't do that. This part's nuts, too. The general's like, no, I'd like also these guys to die. Just <laughs> anyone but me. Everyone. So back with Gil, back with old Gil and his group, Gil and Quince. See, I, I told you Quince got oh, mentioned here. Yeah. They see the Pawnee smoke signals, and neither of them know what they mean. So they're, they're no General Perry. They can't read that shit. They can't. 
understand the burn which has occurred. <laughs> you know who they miss though is Pete because he is really good at reading smoke signals and scouting. Wait, Scout Pete Nolan? Mm-hmm. Oh, he's he's an expert smoke signal reader. I get it now. And at finding water holes and hole digger. Mm-hmm. Another member that I don't know who rides up. I think this might be Wishbone. Uh, it might be Wishbone, but I'd probably know if it was Wishbone. True. Well, and he's busy cooking. He's, he can't <laughs> be doing this other stuff. But anyway, it's one of their people who comes up and he says, I went to the river crossing to meet the Pawnees and give them these 150 scrubs we got. Which, guys, did you know scrubs is a shitty cattle? You know what else scrubs is? <laughs> Not the next show we're doing, that's for sure. I didn't say that. So there were no Pawnees to meet to give those scrubs to, and clearly something is not right here. Meanwhile, Pete, leading the army to Fort McClintock, General Perry stops Pete and says, hey, this doesn't seem right. I may not know the land like you do, Master Scout Pete Nolan, but I think we should already have gotten there by now if we were going the right way. Pete says, well, that's weird because I'm doing the best. This is the only route I know how to take us on. I know what I'm talking about. I actually at this point believed Pete because I was like, ah, shut up, General. Pete knows more than you do. And then we see the cattle and we discover Pete is absolutely leading them on purpose to the cattle drivers to save them instead of following the general. He's doing the right thing. How do you guys think the general would take this news that they've been led astray to the cattle drivers instead of Fort McClintock? I say, ah, okay. That's fine. That's fine. Let's stop and have a meal. He is furious. And as a matter of fact, when Pete comes clean and says he didn't really want the cattle drivers to be at risk, General Perry says, well, you're under arrest. So it's not so much a calm reaction as much as the worst possible reaction. And then he places them under the harshest penalties he can think of, which is, you know what, since this is technically a war situation, I am going to have you under arrest for disobeying a direct order on the battlefield. So you're going to get like the maximum sentence. I'm going to fuck you over as much as possible. Well, it makes sense because love is a battlefield. What is fucking but ingrained with love? Iron pants. <laughs> General Perry then turns to his stupid son, Matt, and <laughs> says, Matt, do you know about this shit? Matt says, no, 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 Pete did this on his own. This is all a surprise to me, General. So the general, he kind of knows, and I would say he completely knows that his son is aware of what Pete was doing, but he has no choice but to take him at his word for now. Plus, he's going to assume the worst about everyone, even if they aren't lying. And honestly, with with that guy, you probably should assume everyone's going to lie to you because you're awful and they know you will punish them if you tell them the truth. Yeah, there's no benefit to being honest with him. This is another good Sergeant Morgan scene. Immediately, General Perry goes up to him to say, that son of a bitch, he's not only weak, he's a liar. I hate my son. And Sergeant Morgan says, I've lied to you hundreds of times. You're a fucking idiot. Anyone can pull it off. Back with the drovers, Wishbone. He is putting together a feast while Mushy stumbles around comedically, dropping those pots. Hold on. I just got to tell you guys, this is my favorite thing in this whole thing. I don't, I don't blame you. Yeah. <laughs> You're more of a wishbone guy or a Mushy guy? Mushy looks like a fucking dumbass. Mm-hmm. Like, how can you not hold on to this? But it is when Wishbone, what's his name? Musky, Mushy. Drops, mushy. He drops Mushy. He drops the pan. And Wishbone says, pick it up, Butterfingers, <laughs> in the fucking sassiest voice. Well, I mean, he lays it on so hard. Well, you know why Mushy keeps dropping stuff, right? Because he has 10 fucking thumbs ten, on his dumb ass hands. of those things. That's not good. What do you think a guy named Mushy's going to do? <laughs> why are you giving him tasks? Yeah. Let him sit in the dirt and play with something. <laughs> Pete shows up during the, the middle of this little argument Wishbone and Mushy are having, and <laughs> everyone's just really happy to see Pete, which you, you guys know why now we have the context of how valuable Pete is and Pete's what a good wonderful. scout he is. And he's really good at taking off his pants, and they just really miss that around here. Another kind of Zobrist-like quality, disrobing in public. So Gil comes over along with everyone else in the crew and says, what in tarnation are you doing here? You don't work for us anymore. But if you do, if you want your job back, we got that spot for you. Pete says, well, okay, so here's the thing. I'm not here on a social visit. Something's going on. And right in the middle of that, the army rides up. Now we have General Perry getting in the middle of it as he approaches the drovers angrily and accuses Pete, hey, not only did you disobey my orders, you're deserting. And in catching Gil up on everything that's going on, Gil realizes exactly what Pete's been doing here and how much he's risked to get to them. And he immediately turns to the general and says, this is what you arrested him for? Is for saving our lives? We already talked about this even last episode, but Gil 
way more likable than Rowdy was. Gil's uh, awesome. Gil has a certain look on his, a skeptical look like, I don't trust the general. I think this is bullshit. You know what else about Gil? Maybe it's just because of the, how the show was intentionally doing it or whatever. It's just, I knew who he was. But I feel like Gil has trail boss on him. I, I just yeah. picked it up off him. I was like, that guy's the boss. He's got boss vibes. That's a guy I wouldn't fuck with. He, when he was younger, boss baby. <laughs> Whoa. And when he gets older, bigger and more underwater, boss Nass. When he teams up with Bull Buchanan, boss man, mm -hmm. but big. So Gil here is talking to old Iron Pants, and he actually mentions that Gil led a Texas regiment against Iron Pants at Chickamauga. Now, I was really confused as to what was occurring. So I looked it up. Chickamauga was possibly the most violent battle in the Civil War, and we are only a few years after the Civil War in the time period of this show. With that in mind, that means either one of Iron Pants or Gill, one of them was for the Confederacy, one was for the Union. Oof. Now, Iron Pants is clearly racist because of the whole hatred towards Indians, so you would be inclined to say, okay, Confederacy. I don't think that's the case because Union won the war. I don't think they're going to let the Confederate generals join at a high rank. You're not going to be a general in the Union Well, anymore. now you've ruined Gill. You've made him a bad guy. Well, see, me. that's the thing. So I wonder if... They're clearly part of the Confederacy because they also mention, uh, I think Iron Pants calls them something like Texas cattle drovers. So they're from Texas. Right. Texas was firmly in the oh, yeah. Confederacy. No doubt there. So I wonder if it's a case of the show presented them as being pro-slavery the whole time and they learned their lesson. Or maybe they're pro-slavery and they haven't learned a lesson. Or they've been anti-slavery the whole time, but because they were in the South, they were forced to conscript for the Confederacy. I don't know, but there's some interesting decisions. And I, I'd that assume could be made. there's no scenario in the 60s that you have a show where your heroes are pro slavery. <laughs> because, yeah, the civil rights movement is kicking into gear yeah. here. So I don't know how they well, made the good guys the Confederates in this, to which be is fair, interesting. People still try to do this today. Well, like, oh, they could have just been in it for the states' rights. Yeah. And it's like, no, you're, you're a piece of shit. <laughs> I mean, I know it's contextual to the time, but I think there were plenty of people in the population who understood owning another human being was not right. It right. wasn't an unheard of belief. I'm sure they skirted around all of yes. that more serious yeah. stuff. And I guess the only way to, to justify it for us, for what we're doing in these two is Gil, he didn't believe in any of it. He was just there. He was just in Texas and he didn't like any of it. Well, it turns out his rank is Captain. important enough to lead people, but not important enough so yeah, to make decisions. Yeah, it's not his fault. None of that. Gil didn't like any of it. We can like Gil if we want to. Gil was like, Robert E. Lee, I don't listen to you. I got cattle to hoard. You can Robert E. <laughs> leave. So Gil is really, at this point, clearly at odds with General Perry and is disgusted by what a mess he's made of this situation and as Van alluded to, doesn't like him from their past anyway. So he's not real pleased to be seeing him or talking to him in the first place. And he says, you know, honestly, this is a mess. You've, you've ruined all this. There's no chance of making peace if you keep doing this. You should at least stay with our group while we're in hostile territory to protect us and help us out a little bit here. General Perry doesn't seem to be interested in this until Gil points out, and by the way, if we were ambushed, you got like a dozen men. I've got twice that amount. It would probably be us protecting you in a fight anyway. You know, it sure would be a shame if that nice shiny group of soldiers you got there were suddenly beset upon by a group of Pawnee Native Americans. It'd be a total shame. Your whole group were attacked. Doesn't that sound like a real shame to you, General? I like that Gil essentially is like, I'm going to kind of threaten yeah, you. He starts kind like of it. hiking up his pants a little bit and getting <laughs> real bossy with him. Which he's, is the opposite of what Pete does with his pants. <laughs> <laughs> he's hitting him with the old trail boss routine for sure. <laughs> and I will say General Perry is like, fine, you got me. And then he- Shit, bro, you right. You've appealed to my cowardice. <laughs> General Perry sends for the most experienced man in Lieutenant Perry's army, which is Corporal Bennett, just so you guys know. Really? That's your most experienced man? Well, don't underestimate Corporal Bennett. He's been through some shit. Fucking Corporal Bennett. And we go through more. <laughs> I wasn't even going to mention Corporal Bennett until I figured out what becomes of him. But they need him, Corporal Bennett, to ride ahead to Fort McClintock to bring back every man they can spare from that garrison to help in this upcoming war that the general is determined they're going to fight or defend themselves against intact, whatever. This is my favorite part of this, is that this general, this I mean, one of the top positions in the U.S. Army, is so dead set on killing Native Americans, Loves starting it. a war, and he has like eight people with him. <laughs> Fucking idiot. Gail does point out here, before they send Corporal Bennett to, well, let's go ahead and say it, his death, 
Gail says, you know, we actually could just give them the cattle we have and try to prevent some of this. We don't necessarily need to fight them. Here's where the general makes yet another horrible call. Look, general, it doesn't need to be any Indian trouble at all. We got 150 head of scrub that we were going to give them anyway. We'd hold them for a while. I'll give no food to hostile Indians. How come you got such a big hate on for the Indians? <laughs> I don't hate the Indians, Mr. Favor. I hate the enemy. Well, when do they stop being the enemy? When they're dead. <laughs> Real understanding guy. The term hate on rules. <laughs> I had never heard that before. Me either. So can you say that instead of having a hard on for something, you have a hate on? For yeah, something? like so. if you're not horny for it, you're angry for it. Can Iron Pants get a hard on because the pants don't, they don't flex. They probably iron. got a little I compartment cl- for that. It would oh, clang okay. into them. So is his it might made ring metal? Them. Iron. The pants are. Old iron dick. But you're, you're not going to clang in the iron with flesh. Owner. <laughs> that hard. Whoop, so he clang. doesn't have a hate on. He has a hard on. In this scenario we're talking about now, yeah, fine. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how we got here, but fine. <laughs> <laughs> There's no better way to summarize General Perry than when they're dead, by the way. <laughs> that line he ends with there is perfect. And I like how Gil just kind of stops then. He's like, oh, uh, all right. I see. There's no appealing to you. <laughs> you're insane. Later, Lieutenant Perry enters the general's tent on his own and nervously confronts his father for the first time here. He expresses his opinion, which is, General, you are doing this wrong, and we should just give the Pawnee the cattle, see if we can avoid a full-scale war. There's zero reason to war with them right now. Yeah. Zero. General Perry says there's no chance Greyhawk will honor the peace agreement, even if we do that. There's no point to give him the cattle. He's just going to betray us and kill us anyway. In fact, if we give them that cattle, it'll just fatten them up so they'll kill us better. They'll be stronger oh and they'll hurt us more. So he sends his son away, not convinced by his argument. As usual, Sergeant Morgan steps in with, yeah, you know he's right and you're wrong, fucker. This conversation might be the first time he shows his like loyalty to the idea of military order and command and laws and rules. And several times he basically says that's worth more than native lives. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he does have, I think, Maybe somewhere in there, a smidge of respect for his son, though, to say, I disagree with you. Yeah, he does. It's part of the scene is like uh, he has to tell him, no, you could make your complaint in writing or whatever, do what you need to do. But no, I'm not changing course. And then secretly he's like, good. Maybe he's not such a soft little baby. Because that's one thing about like old timey, heartless turd men (laughs) is they will only respect someone for being aggressive. It might not matter in what manner, but if you're aggressive, they're like, yeah, that's a virile man. Mm, I got a hate on. It's always <laughs> <laughs> the thing like, you know, warrior tribes for the young one to take over. They have to best the father mm-hmm. in battle. It's that, but with mushy old general men who just want to be yelled at. This is exactly right. This is how my brother and I <laughs> had to beat our dad into submission at bowling to be in a better part of the lineup. Correct. In the meantime, Gil is trying to talk Pete out of giving that cattle over to Greyhawk. And Pete says, look, if I don't do this, this could blow up even bigger than we know. It could affect the entire country. Everyone could be at war. And if you really don't want me to do it, by the way, Gil, just tell me that I can't have the cattle. Gil says, you know I can't do that. You know how Gil rolls? Scout Pete, I can't do that to you. You know, guess who can, though? General Perry. He comes over and says, you can't have that cattle. There's no way you're getting that cattle, Pete. He then approaches Matt, who's fully mounted and ready to assist Pete, and places him under arrest as well now. Matt has reached openly defiant stage, and he says, You know what, General? You can say whatever you want at this point, but I am going with Pete to give Greyhawk these cattle, and that is that. And I'll deal with whatever you want to happen to me later, but I'm not going to listen to you right now. He then kicks his father over when he won't let go of the reins. Like a little baby. And I actually, <laughs> this was one of the scenes where when Daryl Hickman read that line as, as Lieutenant Perry, I was like, okay, this, that guy is really not a bad actor. Yeah. And he got into it. He's, yeah. And then he punted him across the yard. This is what, even though the show's laying it on super thick, like sure. you hate Perry so much at this point, there's a little of raw, raw fist pump of getting him see, seeing him getting kicked in the dirt. Absolutely. I was thinking that I wish that I could have filmed a, a cut of that scene too. Like, can I have? Yeah, a, I'd like to. Can kick I get in the man. horse and kick him now? <laughs> it really is already reaching a point where General Perry is just not even believable. However, maybe it is totally a thing where generals have been this way. I'm actually sort of done thinking anyone this extremely on that side of things is a caricature. I think these people just must have always been real and still <laughs> are. 
The scene fades, and General Perry, proud father that he is, sends out new men to run down and apprehend the renegades, <laughs> who just disobeyed these new orders and left to deliver the cattle to Greyhawk. Their orders are to arrest them, but if there's any kind of fight back, go ahead and do whatever you need to do. Go ahead and kill my son if he doesn't want to get arrested. And before the men can head out, however, everyone's attention Oh, goes... Corporal Bennett's back! Is he? Yeah. Uh, he's at least on the horse that comes back to camp, and they all turn their eyes to, and... There is a rider kind of askew on the horse, and it is Corporal Bennett. Told you he's a fucking joke. He's not alive. Oh. What you have to I say. I thought he was just sleeping. <laughs> this is the TikTok thing, because, you know, they don't want advertisers and words like kills or dies or suicide or whatever. You have to say unalive. Mm. So I've Corporal Bennett that. is now unalive. I've heard that in a verb tense, like, I'll unalive you. I fucking hate it. Yeah, it's stupid. It's, mm. I didn't know about this. The thing is, is that you're supposed to do that so the algorithm doesn't hide your stuff, like on TikTok or whatever. Oh, so it's born out of adhering to tech company guidelines. Correct. Okay, but well, ew, ew, ew. Here's the problem I have with it, is it's always people who have no followers, they don't have any attention or anything, who gives a shit? You're not going to be watched anyway. <laughs> Don't sound like a fucking dipshit just so you think you might get attention from and it. And just never. If you have to, like, alter your speech pattern to uh, appeal to an algorithm, don't do the thing you're doing. Leave it to people who like their thing. <laughs> or to Beaver. You can leave yeah, it to Beaver. you can leave anything to Beaver. It's in the title. <laughs> I'll tell you who you leave it to. You leave it to Dr. Kelso. Well, that seems unrelated. Oh, well, uh, we'll yeah. just paper over I'm that. I'm sure that has nothing to do with anything. Reunion. Gail approaches the general after all this takes place with Corporal Bennett's death and everything, and says, hey, so, <laughs> I don't think you're going to get those reinforcements now, are you? That means that maybe you ought to send the men you're trying to send after your son back, and they should just go ahead and stay put. General says nothing and storms off silently, leaving Gil to hope aloud that the cattle get to Greyhawk in time to prevent further tragedy. Now, I know the implication here is that Wild Horse killed Corporal Bennett, the rogue Native American chief kid, but I like to think that Bennett somehow just died, like he choked on a stick or something or we other. We don't know the horse didn't do it. I was going to say the horse was hungry. Good point. Maybe he hadn't been to a watering hole in too long and he just died oh, of yeah. thirst. He couldn't find a flag first with an arrow. <laughs> <laughs> Need those rocks. Scout Pete Nolan could find it. Gail returns to his camp with the drovers and Sergeant Morgan approaches and informs him, the general is awaiting you in the tent. You need to go have a private audience with him. Inside the tent, General Perry asks, hey, Making some small talk here. How are things going out there? What are you up to, buddy? How's it going? You know, a little chat to chat, a little one-to-one. -one. You and me, we're going to see what's up. See what's a scuttlebutt around camp. Gil says it's fine for now, but that's not going to last. We transition to a perfectly innocent line of discussion here. Van's been waiting on this the whole episode. You know what? What rank were you when you were in the Army, Gil? What rank was he, Van? Captain. It's Why? the best rank. Why? Because you can have some power, but also not much. <laughs> and if something goes bad, it doesn't come back to you. You blame it on... Have enough responsibility. Blame it on your son, yeah. <laughs> your son or Robert E. Lee, one of the two. Blame it on the general. Stonewall Jackson. Uh, the one that got killed by the Native Americans. Custer. Blame it on him. Custer, by the way, was in several episodes of Dr. Wynn Medicine Woman. That makes sense. The actual guy? Yeah. He, they <laughs> resurrected him with the well, necromancy. necromancy. Yeah, fuck. We haven't talked about necromancy in a while. I'm Not glad we touched on it. Well, yeah, it takes a little while in a Western to get to necromancy, but we do. Which I don't know why. People <laughs> die all the time. Gail, by the way, is, as you can imagine, not interested in this kind of military small talk thing mm -hmm. that General Perry is for some reason, trying to hit him with here. I didn't Because Gil's fucking angle. cool. He yeah. does not care about this authoritative hierarchy shit. Gil stops him right away. He's like, I'm not a soldier anymore, so none of this matters. And then General Perry kind of gets to the point. Like, how long do you think it'll take for my son to arrive safely with the cattle there? Because I really actually care about my son secretly. And he says, well, like, they would already be there if they weren't killed on the way. Like Corporal Bennett, General Perry then slips in another question, equally important, maybe more so. You think they're going to come back once they get there and complete that job? And Gail gets mad because he says, you know, if you're talking about Pete, he is not scared and he's not going to run from your court martial order. This fucking scout him. Pete Nolan. He ain't no pussy. And again, uh, Gil, real mad and scary. You get that. You yeah. get that. You don't want to mess with him thing because he puffs his chest out and he's like, general, he is not going to run from your shit. Fuck you. And the general finally picks now to be like, well, my son is tough, too. Pete and they're both basically run. like, my son could beat up your son. <laughs> He's like, oh, Pete will come back. No question. He'll face his repercussions. Wishbone, 
<laughs> probably wouldn't come back. Mushy would be gone. He just wouldn't know what was going on. <laughs> Mushy, Mushy would never lost. understand what happened. He'd get stuck in that watering hole and never come out. <laughs> he so. gets stuck saluting a flag for too long before he dies. <laughs> when Pete leaves angrily, General Perry does kind of have a realization that he, he just said something nice about his son, and honestly, he wonders aloud to Sergeant Morgan, hey, why am I unable to... To communicate with my son when that would do so much good in the situation. I thought this was a, a really nice little aside where he's like, I needed to talk to my son. Why couldn't I? Yeah. Which is a, like, and he the, doesn't get it. He does not understand. The only person he could say that to is Sergeant Morgan. And Sergeant Morgan says, well, you know, just like anything else, general just takes practice and you haven't had very much of it. He doesn't say that, but obviously. You're a bad father. He dunks on him. <laughs> obviously, General Perry is not someone who's ever tried to talk to someone. Let's talk it out. Is not a thing General Perry has ever said. Let's He's kill more, the Native American. <laughs> He's more of a command issuer than a discussion haver. So it's morning now, and the renegades have returned. Not only did they <laughs> good at their jobs, <laughs> successfully reach Greyhawk, they brought him back with them. And we learn Greyhawk doesn't want that cattle. It's out of principle, though. It's like he's. It's not that he doesn't want peace. He doesn't want 150. The agreement was for 500. I want the 500 healthy head of cattle your government ass promised Not me. Not those goddamn scrubs. You hear that, Iron Pants? Timberwolf? Any of his <laughs> names? In this big showdown the whole episode has been pointing toward, Greyhawk and General Perry are in each other's faces, and we kind of reiterate what we already know, which is the only reason the Pawnees are in this situation is because the army did not fulfill their end of the bargain and they're starving. The terms of the peace agreement have not been met. Greyhawk says it's still not too late. You can put an end to this fighting. Just give us the 500 head of cattle that you promised. General Perry says, honestly, Greyhawk, the way your son's been acting lately, it doesn't matter. All that arrangement that we made is nullified and we're not going to give you anything. Greyhawk acknowledges, yeah, my son has been a bit of an asshole lately. He's gone out there, done some stuff, and he deserves to be punished for his wrongdoings. General Perry says, what? You admit that your son's done wrong. We might have a chance here after all, Greyhawk. Just give me your son, and it'll be okay. Greyhawk doesn't know, though, where Wild Horse is. So they can't go through any further with that, and that's the last straw for General Perry, who says, I fucking thought for one second, Greyhawk, that you were going to do something good and that I might be able to not kill you. But you've proven that you're, you're not going to give up your son. I was right not to trust you. War. Back to the war talk. I was kind of on board with the way this whole episode unfolded up to the point of the general being so perplexed that he wouldn't know where his Grey, son was. Well, no, that Gray Hawk would be like, "Yes, my son did wrong. He needs to be punished." The general's like, "What? You would punish your son?" General Perry, though himself, is like, "I'll kill my son if he does something wrong." So right. it's weird that he it's doesn't. Absurd. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's true. And also, the, what I was going to say is, I don't know why he finds it so hard to believe, which they thought you were going to say. Why would he know where Wild Horse is? Wild Horse has gone rogue. Why would he know? He acts like that's the thing. You don't know where he is? Well, you're. I can't trust you. Do you guys think a lot of this is him just finding excuses not to have to say he's yeah, wrong? absolutely. <laughs> oh, and 100%. he's definitely dug himself in and doesn't care. Because I no. think even now he knows a little bit. Like, I think the character's supposed to somewhat. I think part of him kind of having the nice asides to Morgan about Matt is he's also softening in terms of all of his stances, but unfortunately not soon enough. And he's a general in the military. When he says jump, people jump, so... Oh, or how could he toes. be wrong? Or that. <laughs> they might not be able to jump, as we've established. With him, even if he is realizing gradually through Sergeant Morgan and his son and the voice inside his head <laughs> that what he's doing is terrible, I think he's also completely incapable of figuring out how to approach it and reverse course and do anything about it. And I'd it. buy that a guy like that would make the easier choice of rather than untangling this and taking some time to see it through, do what I normally do, which <laughs> is kill, in. kill, kill. <laughs> General Perry says, Matt. Son, apple of my eye, <laughs> that is your prisoner, and we know we can't trust him. I need you to place him under arrest. And this is a big moment because they, we've seen a father and son confrontation. We saw a kick and some, <laughs> and some good yelling, but now we get an even bigger confrontation where Lieutenant Perry reminds his father that he's actually still under arrest himself and that he will follow the order, but only if the general is willing to accept the consequences of what this is going to mean from a moral standpoint. And this is twice now that Matt's been like, I would like to be on record for when all the dust is settled <laughs> that I did not choose any of this. <laughs> this outrages General Perry again, and he asks his son, are you making excuses for what Greyhawk's son has done right now? 
And Matt says, Wild Horse is only guilty of being loyal to his creed, his tribe. And that's the exact same thing you're doing right now, Father. Which is a good point, except that he follows it up with, again, Wild Horse is a, is a, he's a boy and he's an American Indian. Of course, he doesn't say that. He calls him a savage. But he's pointing out that Wild Horse is a fucking uncivilized brute. You're supposed to be a general. So yeah. you should know better. And there's some old timey thinking in here, but I will say like the general idea of like, you've been given access to all of the information and education in the world general, and you've chosen to act oh, this way. His point this definitely is a kid. stands. Yeah. I like this Matthew Perry a lot more than the other one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. His point here is definitely accurate. They just deliver it in that, in that, oh, kind of the wrong oh it was a long sense. time ago. Way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It just uh, it, that part was a little off track, but most of it is still going pretty well here, tone wise. So, having finished annihilating his father verbally here, <laughs> Lieutenant Perry reluctantly does begin to comply with the order. He does apologize to Rayhawk first and says, I'm sorry, Rayhawk, I've, I've got to do this. But before he can actually officially put him under arrest, there is a gunshot. The mounting tension has reached this point, and we hear a loud crack from a part of the scene that we can't see, a gunshot in the distance. Everyone turns in that direction at the same time, and they're startled because they didn't realize they were surrounded. Dumbasses. But it's Wild Horse, of course. Of course. <laughs> I didn't even mean to write that. <laughs> of course, of course, it's Wild Horse. Wait, it's, it's Wild Horse, of course, of course. It's the show, Mr. Ed. So the guy, whoever he is, wanders up to the stable, looks in, and it's Wild Horse, the Native American kid sitting in there like, give me an apple. (laughs) Whatever horses And then everyone's like, you said you had a... Of course this guy can fucking talk. (laughs) You said a talking horse. When we see Wild Horse appearing with that gun, he was the one who fired the shot, and he advances on the group. General Perry says, aha, I knew that you had Wild Horse with you all along. I knew you were a liar, Greyhawk. The general loves this. He'd rather be right and murder <laughs> and than die, wrong, yeah. Yeah, wrong and live. And Greyhawk is like, I didn't know he was with me. I just, I don't know everything my son's up to. He sneaks out after curfew all the time. His skateboard is always being used. <laughs> <laughs> he then orders his son to put down that rifle and call in his men. Wild Horse refuses. Calls his father a fool and says, Father, I am the Pawnee chief now. Takes uh, his finger and his thumb, puts it <laughs> in an L. Just like right Brian to did to you. Yep. And then he goes on and on about how, Dad, you're super lame. The music you listen to is for fogies. <laughs> exactly true in this, in this weird Western context. Wild Horse says they're taking this cattle and whatever other cattle they need, and that's just how it's going to be from now on. As a matter of fact, they're going to take General Perry, too. All the while, Perry remains indignant. He doesn't care because if you do anything like this, you're just helping his viewpoint be valid. The Greyhawk cautions again, look, son, White Horse. Apple of my eye. (laughs) The general is more than just a man, son. He is... A bad man. (laughs) The way he says it here is, this man's famous. He's a fucking superstar, but... Have you seen his pants? (laughs) What he means, of course, is he's the symbol. He's the the white man's symbol. If you shoot him, he will become more powerful than anything you could ever imagine. He whooshes away and his, his robes fall to the ground. Yeah. There's a lot of power, weirdly, in the symbolism of this, too of Greyhawk kind of understanding like what the general has been fighting for is more than like even our tribe versus yours. It's for this sort of big oppressive hand you can't control. Oh, goosebumps right now. It's a big moment. So if you do kill him, he'll become a martyr and the soldiers won't quit until they wipe us all out. You can't kill him, Wild Horse. Wild Horse says, you know what, old man? I'm going to kill him. I don't care. Your time's passed. The new age is here. This is the part that Brian was talking about. Like, I don't like your music. I don't like your clothes. We're going to do it my way now. It's a new dawn for the Ponies. Nice gray hair. (laughs) Geezer. Gray hawk. (laughs) He also reminds him, by the way, gets in one last little barb here. It's not like you didn't have plenty of wars in your day, old man. Let me have mine. He keeps his gun pointed at the general and says, last chance, General Perry. You come with me, or I'm going to shoot you down right here. And suddenly we hear another gunshot. It's off screen, so we don't know exactly who shot it, but Wild Horse doubles over in pain and drops to the ground. Well, mostly. I I had to say something. He waits. This is my favorite death of any Blue Two Boys episode. I was pretty confused. First off, he gets shot, like, bends over because he's been shot in the stomach. he looks more mad than anything else. Yeah, and he holds his gun up in the air above his head and then throws it in the ground like he's having a tantrum. Then he slowly crumples to the ground. He acts like he's been hit in paintball and he's pissed he lost. Yeah, he's like, been eliminated. Yeah, not that he's dead. 
The reveal, of course, though, is that the shooter, the person who did this to Wild Horse, is none other than his father. What? He wasn't lying after all. In yeah. fact, perhaps he should have been. <laughs> <laughs> we pan the camera to Greyhawk with the smoke coming out of the gun. They didn't actually do that, but you get the idea. Greyhawk. This isn't gun smoke, Spencer. Yeah, I, know. I got my shows mixed up. We get a sense of Greyhawk having just done the ultimate act of sacrifice for the better of the world as a whole. He pulled a god. And he says. <laughs> <laughs> now we just... You mean Wild Horse to roll out from under a rock in three days. <laughs> he makes eye contact with General Perry and says, you believe me now? General Perry says, no, just proves you're bloodthirsty and you'll kill anyone. At this point, I was so frustrated. I was like, what's this guy got to do, man? Shoot himself. The general's whole thing is bloodlust. He yeah. wants war. He wants to kill everyone. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, he takes this moment to be like, you're a monster. You killed someone. You I would never me. let anyone die. <laughs> Now all hell breaks loose and there's gunshots from all over and just everything's going crazy as Greyhawk approaches his son's body to, I don't maybe say goodbye or something. And I think what he's supposed to do is close his eyes and say to better days. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely what we've learned in the past. This is the point where General Perry is struck in the crossfire in the shoulder by a stray bullet and Matt is a good son and he rushes in to get him out of that crossfire. And take his pants off. Uh-huh. You know, like you do. I guess it's He learned it from Pete. I think it was a tourniquet thing, but no. it's like and the general says something I mean, like, it was Yeah, get that belt off. Part tourniquet, but only part. Well, you don't need to take off iron pants. <laughs> you just need to take off iron pants. It should have been quite a struggle to get his pants off when you think about it. <laughs> it's a twenty minute scene. <laughs> the general has a bit of an advantage here because if he gets shot below the belt, it just ricochets off. Just like with his boners. That's why he got shot in the Achilles shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> all the while in all this chaos, Greyhawk is standing his ground in the middle of the gunfire. It's a lot like Gus in that Breaking Bad episode where there's shooters and he has to go out and face them down so they stop shooting. You guys remember that episode? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just like that. This is just, just like that. Exactly like that. Well, except that Greyhawk can't get his people to stop shooting. No, but he's trying. He's like, look, I killed your other leader, coincidentally <laughs> my son. Listen to me again. The soldiers are dropping left and right here, and Matt realizes that Greyhawk's going to be next if he doesn't go out and try to save him too, in addition to his dad. So Matt, the brave fool that he is, runs back out there and immediately eats a bullet to his gut. <laughs> uh-huh, no good. It should be added, Matt, in a shockingly little quick exposition dump, he's like, I've got to go save Greyhawk. It's the only chance at universal peace we have. <laughs> he seriously says something like My that. My planet needs me. <laughs> Greyhawk continues to plead all the while at the Pawnees as Matt sits there bleeding out. And Matt asks his father with his final words, have I finally proven myself to you? And that's very sad that he his last words go to his terrible, uncaring father. I don't know. It's a pretty sick send off to leave him with that guilt for the rest yeah, of his life. But I do like that. <laughs> from Lieutenant Perry's point of yeah, view, that it's, part's it's, sad. it's a leap to know that your father will be impacted by it. In the end, he is. But well, he doesn't ever get that confirmation that it even worked. That his dad wasn't like, ah, fuck you. A better way to get to his dad for sure might have been him like, dad, you're not good at murders. Or just shoot his dad. <laughs> As he's dying. That would have fixed, yeah, fixed a lot of problems. This is what I really wanted to do. <laughs> I'll see you in hell in a bit. <laughs> Give me five minutes, ten tops. <laughs> Depends when I bleed out. This is a kind of an interesting turn in the scene that I kind of thought was a little dumb. So Greyhawk's not getting it done, right? Well, Pete decides that he can Cough he's white the, savior, cough. He's the savior here that can do what Greyhawk cannot. And he's just tired of how rude the Pawnees are being here by shooting all those bullets everywhere. And rude. He takes his gun belt off, demands that they stop being mean and come out from hiding. Then he takes his pants off again. <laughs> Pawnees immediately listen to Pete because he's white and the shooting ends. Yeah, I don't like this. No. And it, it is like a Native American clown car, though, because they keep piling out of the trees. <laughs> everywhere. No wonder they were able to shoot so many bullets. And the dust settles after all of this because we don't we don't see the aftermath of the Pete after discussion. <laughs> we'll see those someday. We don't see the discussion that Pete has with the ponies, but obviously it's enough to at least stem the tide at the moment. So the dust settles, we get a burial scene for the dead and an opportunity for General Perry and Grey Hawk to have one of their own little like symbolic burial scenes for the hatchet they had going between them. Gotta bury that hatchet is what I was saying there, guys. Which oh. works because it's Native American. Yeah, it using, works on right? a couple levels. The general commissions Gil for 500 head of his best beef and pledges to ride with Greyhawk to Black Canyon to make their peace official. So in this scene, the general has decided, look, this whole thing was awful. Greyhawk, 
I will make peace with you. You will get your cattle. And Greyhawk's like, you're a piece of shit. Fine. I just, I'll take your peace offering, but I do hate you. Matt being dead is like the unlocking of the general going on his little uh, apology tour around <laughs> everyone. Like, oh, I've been real bad. I know what's happened is kind of, uh, how should I say this? Like, ooh, unforgivable. <laughs> I do like that Greyhawk takes that stance. He's like, I'm taking this cattle and you're going to fucking go with me and make this right with my people. But it is not because we're even. And no one forgives him because he has another conversation shortly after this that goes much the same way where he's like, I, I see the error in my ways. You're like, great. I hate you. You've yeah. done too much wrong. At like this you've point. lived your whole life as the devil. I'm, I can't do anything now, man. The general pats himself on the back and says, I am a wonderful man now. <laughs> it's fine now. It's good that he gets that peace and closure for himself. <laughs> I don't even mind that my kid died. <laughs> Greyhawk too has one last little burn here when they part ways. He's like, well, right up there to meet my people and he, you'd better ride up to make your peace with God yeah. after that yeah. for what you hey, did. Buddy, why don't you get on the tallest mountain and scream at God your shit, huh? You murdered your son. And this was basically the last smoke signal burn, <laughs> <laughs> effectively, of saying like, yeah, you're going to need to consult a higher judge to get your peace cleared. Meanwhile, Pete and Gil are saying their goodbyes because, remember, guys, Pete is out of the show at this point. This was just a return, even though he's really good at scouting. Good to see him, though. He is. He's not going to stick around. Gil tells him, hey... I really wish you'd stay. We could use you. The army needs them more, though, and General Perry interrupts their conversation and says, and we'll sure be putting him to good use. Pete, I've decided that I will not have you arrested and shot. Ooh, how generous. And I guess Pete's stuck with this general. Can he not just be like, can I go be with any other army people? This would be the time to ask, like right after burying his son when he's all fresh and apologize-y. <laughs> <laughs> you could steamroll him. Yeah. Like, hey, you know you killed your kid, pretty much? Maybe let me go Well, and that's else. how it could go. Like, hey, I want to kind of get out from under your thumb. Oh, I kind of need you here, Pete. Killed your son. Fuck. <laughs> okay, you can go. General Perry takes this time now to have his other little, hey, I, I know I'm awful, but forgive me conversation with Gil. And he leads it with, all right, Gil, so you're leaving. Everyone's leaving, going in separate ways. We'll probably never see each other again. And Gil has a little line like, oh, I, I'm okay with that. That sounds good to me. And General says, yeah, I know. I know, but. If it's worth anything to you, Wild Horse could have learned a lot from his dad, and it turns out I could have learned a lot from my son. Gil says, cool, bye, hate you. Gil's like, yeah, that's fine. Everyone's still dead, bud. We can't change it. Everyone having that attitude, I really enjoyed. Agreed. It's perfectly done. Yeah. And Sergeant Morgan gets one more translation in as the episode ends, and he says, hey, what he means to say is that if he could die for his son, he would do that, if he could. But now he has to live with the shame of having killed his kid. For the rest of his life. In a way, he's the biggest victim of all of us right uh -huh. now. <laughs> this is a bit like death penalty versus life in prison, you know? This guy's got to sit and deal with it. He's not getting the easy way out. The trail crew says goodbye to Pete. Pete goes to be a scout somewhere else, and everyone rides away. And we ride away from Rawhide. <laughs> Woo! What did we learn? Native American's bad. Mm, yeah, that's right? my biggest takeaway. Mm -hmm. Fuck Greyhawk. Greyhawk's a piece of shit. And also Grandma Good. <laughs> I liked the kind of dichotomy of the in a town episode and the out in the range episode. Sure. Like we got kind of a little bit of both. Which episode did you guys prefer, but also which style? I really enjoyed getting to see both. And I don't even know if that was intentional. It Spencer, wasn't. But. Well, so, okay. The first one I picked because I wanted to make sure it wasn't because of a grandma van. I know what you're doing. <laughs> it wasn't because of grandma. It was because I wanted to make sure we got a Clint Eastwood episode. Okay. Mm. I wanted a lot of rowdy. Grandma was just a bonus. Yeah. You yeah. see grandma and you go, great. That's icing on the cake. <laughs> what the, the, the large <laughs> piece of cake. The other, <laughs> and pie. <laughs> The other one that I picked was strictly because I saw Lieutenant Matthew Perry. Yeah, he came like, into the studio and you were laughing you're like, I have to do this one. <laughs> so that was a complete coincidence. I would have actually probably not picked it if I had known, because I wanted to double dose of Clint Eastwood. If I had known he wasn't in that, I probably wouldn't have picked that one. I really think it worked out perfectly at showing what all the show can kind of do, because it has a lot more range than I suspected it would. Comparing to what I expected a Western to be, the time frame to be, it was way better than I thought. I was surprised in many ways. And the biggest thing I already said was that I can't believe how modern the tone was. I really yeah. thought it would be a super dated, what they would have called at the time, like a cowboys and Indians thing. I almost would have thought that the general, his attitudes and actions, 
that would have been the show's mentality. At least the show would have had a little more like, oh, you know how he is. Yeah. But the show is like, he's a villain. This guy's awful, and everyone at the end that you know you're supposed to identify with agrees he's awful. To answer your question, though, I think I actually did prefer the grandma one because it seems yeah. like that was more diverting from what the show normally did. I think what we just covered is probably more rawhide. It's them out in the wild with cattle and coming across whatever kind of encounter that stops them from getting the cattle where it's supposed to go is, uh, and is I, the premise of the I show. I think this episode makes it pretty clear the show was fine taking on issues or trying to. Oh, yeah. Apparently they did a lot of that, too, and it, they weren't afraid to get dark at points. My big regret is that we didn't get any exposure to the dynamic between Gil and Rowdy, which I think would be a, yeah. a big part of the show is Rowdy's kind of like having to accept playing second fiddle despite his hot-headed nature and Gil being a really good leader and kind of molding him in, in such a way to be his successor, which is what he was doing. And just as a person who's watched film and television, I think it'd be fun to watch Clint Eastwood be someone's second fiddle. I've never seen that. Yeah, that's true. This show was a hell of a lot better than I anticipated yeah. it being. I definitely agree with that. Between the two episodes, I mentioned last time that the grandma episode bored me at times. This one didn't. There was a lot of weird stuff that was dumb or whatever. Some of the plotting was so dense that you had to kind of sort it out as the episode was yeah. progressing. I felt like the beginning and the end was a lot of rewatching scenes to make sure I understood the details. It There's was chaotic All at that times. dialogue. But I did like the story overall. I liked the way it was told. I could obviously find flaws with it. Oh, but yeah. I liked this episode more than the grandma one. And I think... From a comedy perspective, <laughs> there were more weird things going on in this one that we could make fun of than the last one. Grandma However, took care of all that herself. Yeah, if if you take Grandma out of that, obviously you're removing the entire plot but of the first episode. First off, shame on you. Yes, <laughs> I think that episode was kind of bland. But again, this was fun, and that is the most surprising aspect to me is that I enjoyed watching these two episodes despite being a little bored the first one. I think this might be as surprised as I've been by any show we've covered in terms of Ooh. my enjoyment level. I went in thinking this was very homeworky, and mm -hmm. it didn't feel that way to me. I definitely was, as the person who had to make the most notes, well, yeah, that, very much so that changes it. it. <laughs> as, well, I mean, it's a, it, you have to make sure you understand every stupid little fine point, and I dreaded getting the preparation done for this as much as, any as, as, much as anything we've done, and it really wasn't that bad, yeah. so it... It did surprise me in that same way. I really think the Waltons has impacted all of us so negatively because I think that's what your mentality was, is this is going to be like when I had to write the uh, Waltons John notes. boy, God damn it. Where are you going to hit pause and be like, we're only four minutes into this episode? Oh, <laughs> well, and I haven't even seen a ghost yet. It was really pleasantly surprising. Having said that, of course, I mentioned at the top of the first episode we did here, we are just so not Western-themed people that there is no show we could ever watch that would ever have any real impact on us is like, that's a Western and I, it's not for me ultimately in the end. Do you know, Spencer, if there were any episodes where they had like minute work, that band come in and do songs throughout a couple of them that were kind of in, into the plot of the yeah. episode. Well, they didn't okay. want to overdo it. Actually. I noticed that Colin Hay is a frequent guest star on Rawhide. Okay, good, good. And you know, they also didn't really reveal what the name of Lieutenant Perry's mom was. Dr. Cox. Arla. Oh, it seems like you're leading up to something, and I guess I might as well let you take the reins. Yeah, we got to figure out what the turkey's doing. <laughs> well, let's we'll talk about our next show I'll be hosting for the next couple of weeks. And then something exciting's happening that we've done before, but we'll, we'll get to that when we get to it. All kinds of exciting things are getting ready to happen. And I, of course, did my contest thing where I left a lot of hints throughout this episode, the one we're recording right now. So listeners out there, if you have an idea what it is, somehow <laughs> send it in with all the things that you notice, and whoever has the most things they notice, gets to talk to Matthew Perry. Spencer, like me, are you in the boat where you're like, is he making it overly obvious so then he'll swerve and do some other thing? Like no, actually, Caroline I'm, in the city, I'm or? too naive. I just, I believe that he, he's going to do exactly what we think he's going to do. Really, I kind of think so, because I think I think Van, who's in the room with us, I like how I'm, I've initiated this side conversation. I think Van would like to make fun of Scrubs. I don't know that he could host that himself and keep the food down. But we'll see. Gonna be interesting. I'm not doing scrubs. I fucking hate scrubs. Why would I pick scrubs? I did that just because they said scrub so, cattle a bunch. My little inclination then was was on, on the nose then. But both of our episodes of the show we will be covering feature an actor that was previously featured on the Boob Tube Boys. A little tidbit there. You, Brian, your last episode of a show that you picked was the 1980s Street Hawk. It was wonderful. 
Spencer said, no, I can do better. I'm going to do the 1960s. <laughs> That's not what I said, but yes. No, That's precisely though. what you said. So I said, let's go in the middle. I need to do something in the 70s. I haven't done a 70s show yet. No. To my knowledge. Are you doing that I don't 70s think you show? Have. I also would like to remind you guys, or let you guys know in a little secret in the industry, comic book movies, they're here to stay. I think they're a little popular, in case you didn't know that. So I thought we could maybe dive into the comic book nature of entertainment. So we're doing the 1970s hit television show, Wonder Woman. Wow. Starring Linda Carter. Linda Carter, yeah, who by the time we were kids was mostly in like a 1-800 eyeglasses commercial mm -hmm. phase of her career. Now, the two episodes we're going to be covering are from season one and season two, although there's some weird stuff involved with Wonder Woman in that. Technically, it started out as a movie or a couple made-for-TV movies. Then they did a season, and then it switched networks and did a couple more seasons. So depending on the platform you're looking at, the numbers may be wrong. Just go by the episode titles. That happens so much with the older it shows. It is weird. So first off, we're covering season one, episode seven, Wonder Woman versus Gargantua. Awesome. The Nazis try to get back an agent who turned on them. To help them in their efforts, they brainwash a gorilla named Gargantua to hate <laughs> Wonder Woman. Sounds cool. I've seen this episode. We're going to love it. This episode features a return to the boob tube boys of the man who is a sidekick to Mr. Magnum P.I. I'm, of course, talking to John Hillerman Higgins from Magnum P.I. He returns as the German scientist. Another Higgins, a name we've been talking Holy about crap. ad nauseum during these Rawhide episodes. And then our next episode is season two, episode six, The Pied Piper. In this one... We have Eve Plum, a.k.a. Jan Brady, okay, as well as Martin Mull. Do you guys know that guy? Oh, yeah. He was in Roseanne. He was in Roseanne. He was a gay, like, restaurant owner. He was uh, Colonel Mustard in the Clue movie. Anyway, you, you'd know him if you saw him. Rock star Hamlin Rule. Do I need to say that name again? All right. You don't need to say anything <laughs> else for me to know I want to watch this. I love dumb fake rock stars. Oh, you're going to love this one. Uh, see Street Hawk. <laughs> I would assume, though, that this synopsis needs to start with after Gargantua. What's, what's, what's <laughs> yeah, no, name? that's right. After Gargantua wins against Wonder Woman and takes over. And He's it, Wonder the show Woman. is now, yeah, okay. Rock star Hamlin Rule hypnotizes his female groupies into robbing his concert's box office. When he hypnotizes the daughter of IADC agent Joe Atkinson, and that's the Wonder Woman agency. Oh, yeah, the IADC, of course. Of course. Wonder Woman intervenes to free her. Now, Martin Mole is Hamlin Rule, and a he has a little- Martin Mole is a rock star? He has a little wispy mustache, and what was the name of the episode? The Pied Piper. What instrument do you think he plays? The flute. The flute. This is great. He's like Zamfir. Well, the king of the pan flute. Yeah, or Ian Anderson. Secondary king of the regular <laughs> flute. So yeah, Wonder Woman. I, like I said, I watched the first episode with the ape. Holy shit, it's great. I watched about 20 minutes of the second one. Holy shit, it's great. The direction I didn't fun. expect. No, it, it's great. I. What direction did you expect? Not this Scrubs. one. Scrubs. That's silly. I did briefly consider internally like, oh wow, our first superhero show. And then I remembered it is not at all. Bible man. <laughs> oh, good point. <laughs> this is super interesting because Wonder Woman being like, a, it's great for the feminist movement, and this is the 70s, so I wonder how they will tackle that. They really don't do anything that's like, oh, a Wonder Woman, who cares? She's treated just like a superhero, so I think they did a really good that's job good. with it from what I've seen. Obviously, I haven't done my research yet. We'll see. Okay. Well, this will be interesting. Yeah, it kind of answers a, a question that I had the entire time we were doing these episodes of Rawhide. It was like, honestly... All this work to rustle up that cattle, take them hundreds of miles. They don't have any water holes. They just had a superhero that did that for them. And we got our answer. We're going to transition smoothly from cattle to apes. Oh my God. I've been talking about apes all <laughs> this whole time. And now we're getting an ape next That's episode. Part, it's oh. almost as if you meant to. <laughs> I didn't for <laughs> once. I ape appreciate it. Who's that gorilla? What's that guy's name? Magilla gorilla? That's right. Oh, here I live at this. Pet store with the guy who didn't like me. That's all I know about. What more could anyone want from a podcast? <laughs> I should have one? picked that. <laughs> Before we do get out of here, now that we've given you, we've hit you with the bonus of what's to come. And the McGill and McGorilla stuff. All kinds of little stuff in there. Before we do that, we are I'm pretty sure that you're going to want more of us, being that you made it this far in the episode, and how could you not? So there's other places you can find our content. Really, I've always said I recommend just going to Google and typing in boo to ink or boob to boys or old iron pants, uh, any of that, it will all lead in a series <laughs> of rocks and an arrow directly to us. <laughs> You're going to find us everywhere. We're on YouTube, even where Van makes our episodes, um, YouTube podcast episodes. And we also have a website, boo to ink.com. 
We are on TikTok still, right? We're on TikTok. You should find us on TikTok. Speaking of YouTube, Van did a video for the sketch we did for Forged in Fire. It is really funny. Go watch it. Way too professionally done not to have a large view count. So yeah, you need to check that out on YouTube. And we currently have like 50 and, and we're getting dislikes and everything because pe- fucking people who watch Forged in Fire are like, this ain't about Doug Marquita being a man. I think this might be fake. That's so <laughs> funny too, like where you see something and you're like, thumbs down yeah. on hours of work and hard effort and all that. Like, thumbs down, that sucks. Yeah, it never so, fails. So dumb. It's like, oh, this is supposed to be a parody. Oh my God. Go watch that video and give it a thumbs up to make That's those right. people go away. And then thumbs up us on, on iTunes and- We'll get a grandma on tattoo. Give us five thumbs up on your podcast app. But not 10 thumbs like no, not, Mushy's hands. not all thumbs. That's alarming. And we will get mushy tattoos of thumbs <laughs> if you give us a five-star oh, rating oh on, my God. on got Apple horrible. iPod. Oh, pick it up, Butterfingers. <laughs> Is that all of it? Did we do anything else that we yeah, haven't I talked think, about? I think we're good. We're pretty accomplished. Today. We're on the internet everywhere, and you can find us. And and our company CEO mascot, Butu, he's all over the place, and he's really, he's quite adorable. I think we should just leave it there for this time and we'll come back and we'll do Wonder Woman next week as long as you guys have picked up all your stray cattle from the ground. I've got some scrubs that are still kind of wandering God damn loose. it. Well, we can't leave until you pick up all those scrubs. Scrub is a cow that can't get no love from me. Becky from Roseanne. He just rode up to the river crossing. I think this might be Crookshanks. <laughs> the cat? I think this... What's his actual name? I, I think this might be I have no Wh- idea. I, I don't know any of their fucking names. I think this I think this might <laughs> It's all just gray men. I That's think, all it is. 